Good morning. Well, the passage that we're going to take a look at today is a somber one. It seems like we've gone through a few somber passages over the last few weeks, doesn't it? I mean, we're in the end of Matthew chapter 7 right now, and, and so three, four weeks ago, we learned about the narrow gate and the broad gate, and then a few couple weeks ago, we learned about, um, you know, the false prophets, and now we're going, to, or that was last week, now we're going to learn about um, the fact that not everyone who says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Our passage today describes people who think that they're good with God, but in reality their lives and lack of relationship with Jesus say the opposite. And I'm going to tell you something very important today. There is a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God personally. It's possible, friends, to go and attend church every week of your life and still not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's possible to serve with Kindred Life Ministries and to volunteer with them. It's possible to serve in soup kitchens and charities and still not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's possible even to preach from a pulpit or do miraculous things in the name of Jesus even and still not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The words that we're going to look at today, in my estimation, are probably the most terrifying in the Bible because it describes people who think that they're good with God, but they're really, actually not. It's powerful, this passage is powerful and scary. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So before we start, let's pray again that the Lord Jesus would make our relationship with him real and help us to do the will of the Father as an outworking of that relationship. Let's pray. Oh Lord, your servant, the Apostle Paul, wrote in the book of Philippians, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Lord, we echo that prayer. We want to know you, not just to know about you, not just to know facts about you, but to have a real life-giving relationship with you. Lord, help us to have that. There's no way we can do it in our natural selves. You need to come to us, Lord, and take away our heart of stone, which is naturally against you, in order for us to have a loving fellowship with you. And so that's what I pray now. I pray that you would take away any hindrances inside of our hearts that we would have toward you. Open the door of our hearts and walk in. Enter in, Lord. Come into our lives. Do so even if we don't want it right now. Do it anyway. Come into our lives and change us. Lord, I, I pray that the passage that we're going to study today would not be true of any person that hears my voice right now that every single person here would know you and love you and want to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. The passage that we're going to study is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, if you open your Bibles there. If you don't have a Bible, it should be in the pew in front of you. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, 
Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In this verse, Jesus is distinguishing between lip service and real discipleship. He's telling the difference between a person who can talk a good talk and not actually walk it. Hypocritical, so-called Christians, that's what he's talking about. The world knows what kind of people those are. The world watches us. Charles Spurgeon said, the only Bible that the worldly people really may ever read is the Christian. And so if the Christian doesn't live for God, well, then the world looks and says, ah, I can see, right, that person says that they believe this, but what a bunch of hypocrites. They give a bad name to the whole church. It is much easier, friends, to profess Christianity than to possess Christianity. It's much easier to say, oh, of course, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah. You know, I said a prayer in Awana when I was six, and then, you know, I'm good. I'm good. And, yeah, sure, I've lived for sin and hell and the devil for the rest of my life, but I said the prayer. I have the fire insurance, and that's what really matters, right? And, and so, I mean, at least that's what I was told. That's what I was taught. No. No. God doesn't just want your creedal affirmation. You can believe true things about him. Demons believe true things about God. But true faith is not that. True faith is a relationship with Jesus in which you correspond with him. You, you speak to him. And when he speaks to you through his word, you listen to him. And you want to follow him, and you want to obey. It's much easier to profess Christianity than to possess Christianity. Do you know the majority of Americans profess it? And, and so I, I know that there are some here, we could have a long argument or nice discussion, okay, about whether America is or is not a Christian nation, okay? And I, I heard this guy named Michael Medved on the radio. You guys ever heard of him before, Michael Medved? Um, and I called up his show because he had said on his show, and this is a couple years ago, he had said on his show, well, of course, America is a Christian nation, and the majority of people in America are Christians. And so, you know, and he's very friendly to, to Christian people. And so I, so I called the show, and I got on the radio, and, and I said to Michael Medved, you, you know, uh, I have to... I mean, it depends on what you mean when you say America is a Christian nation. Do we have Christian principles as a part of our founding documents? Okay, in that sense, maybe you could maybe say that. But I disagree when you say that the majority of Americans are Christian. And he said, well, of course they are. There's like, you know, 100 million Catholics in America. <laughs> All right? And, there's, and the vast majority of people will say that they have some kind of faith in Jesus. And I said, okay, right, and we don't know their heart, but there's a difference between saying, oh, I'm a Christian, and then actually really believing that Jesus is the Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead for your justification, and you know him and you have a relationship with him. And he said, we have to go. Thank you for calling. And he hung up. <laughs> yeah, and there's a difference between those two things. The majority of Americans profess Christianity, but, but I mean, look at, the, look at this country today. Would we really say that, you know, that that's actually the case? So, I mean, according to the Bible, according to a Christian is to live. Do we really think that America is majority Christian? I don't think so. God says that his people are a remnant. In every nation, he has a remnant. These verses are an extension of the previous verses where Jesus says, as we learned last week, you will know a tree by its fruit. You see, it might look like a good tree, but if it doesn't produce the fruit of a good tree, then it's actually a bad tree. A person might really look like a Christian to others. They might even call Jesus Lord, and yet their fruit tells a different story. 
And as I said, there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God personally in a loving relationship. There's all the difference in the world between those two things. There was a young lady who I was just speaking with just the other day, and she was wondering the difference about these two things. And what's the difference between knowing about God and personally knowing him? And, and I said, okay, well, do you like Justin Bieber? She's a nine-year-old girl. And she said, no, I hate Justin Bieber. I said, okay. Well, well, you should love him in Christ, okay? But, but who do you like? And she named some singer that she likes, some famous singer. And, and I said, okay, can you tell me about this singer? And she said, oh, she has long blonde hair. And, and I said, okay, uh, is she tall or short? Oh, she's tall. And uh, how old is she? Well, she's maybe 20, 28 or 29. Okay. Did you know her name? And she said her name. I don't know her name. And... And I said, yeah, you know all these things about her, and that's good. But w- would you say that you know her personally, that she's your friend? And she said, no, she doesn't know me. I don't really know her. And I said, right, but there would be a difference if that famous singer who you really like, who you know a lot of things about, she came over and she gave you a hug and she said, here, here's my phone number. You can call me anytime." And you said, really? And then you gave her your phone number, and you talk on the phone with each other all the time. Then you would say, wow, see, I don't just know about that person. Lots of people know about her. She's famous. Lots of people know about her. But I know her. I know her. I have a relationship with her. And I told that young lady that. She said, "Ah, I get it. I understand now. That's what it means to have saving faith in Jesus. You have to know him, not just about him. We were made to know God personally. It should be our aim in life to know God. Jesus says in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That's what eternal life is about, knowing God personally. If you know him personally, you will live forever and never die. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire, this is the Lord, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. See, he wants his people to know him. He wants his people to have relationship with him. And when they do, it really changes everything about our lives. Yesterday I found out that... Uh, a friend of mine from the Village Church of Barrington. His 12-year-old son was riding his bicycle um, in the parking lot of the Barrington Library yesterday. And he tried to jump the curb, and he fell off his bike and hit his head on the ground and died. I feel so heartbroken. I can't even imagine what my friend is going through right now. His boy, who he loves, is just playing with his friend. falls off his bike and dies. And my other friend was there in the hospital, and actually after the kid fell off his bike, he he seemed to be okay, and he went home. And his, his mother, you know, looked him over, and he looked all right, and he had a bump on his head, and He said he was tired. He went to sleep on the couch and he never woke up. And friends, outside of Christ, there's no hope in in a situation like that. I mean, I feel so heartbroken for my friend because that kind of a loss is the, I think it's probably the greatest loss you can have. But I told him, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. 
because he lives. That's the only way that my friend and his wife and that boy's sisters can face tomorrow. Because Jesus is really alive and because they know him. I can't imagine going through a situation like that that they, that they are still right now I, I'm broken, devastated. I can't imagine going through a situation like that without knowing Jesus, without having a relationship with Christ. Knowing the Christ who really did conquer death, who really is our, our living hope. The world has no hope to offer a person like that, a father who's grieving, a mother who's grieving. The world has no hope. This world is just a spinning graveyard outside of Christ. But the resurrected Christ is sustaining my friend and his wife. Let's pray for their family right now. Oh Lord, I pray for the Callis family. Lord, have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. Give them the peace that only you can give right now. As a church family, we lift up our prayers to you, Lord, knowing that you are the only hope in the whole world. You are the only hope. Lord, be with them now as they face this, the plans to do a funeral for their 12-year-old boy. Have mercy, Lord. Give them the hope that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen. Knowing Christ makes a difference in our lives. He's the only one who can actually give us hope. In Jeremiah chapter 9, starting in verse 23, it says this. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let us boast in the fact that we know Christ, that we know him, and he's the one who has saved us. He's the one who died on the cross for us and rose from the dead for our justification. Man's chief purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our purpose in life, friends. Our purpose is to have a relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I can tell you right now, you are not living out the purpose for which God created you. I was watching this video of, of a guy named Bill Maher the other day. You guys know who that is, Bill Maher? Thank you. You know who Bill Maher is? He's a, an atheist. And he, he, was, he was mocking Christians, and he was saying that, uh, you know, he was reading out of some book where, where the, the writer said that, uh, that man's purpose is to live for God. And he said, ah, to live for God. What garbage. What foolishness. And he didn't give any alternative explanation what he believes the purpose of life is. To him, the purpose of life is money or, or fame. But when he dies, all of that will be gone. He will have no more money, and he will have no more fame, and Bill Maher will be forgotten. Only in Christ can we find our true purpose in life. That's why we were created. We were created to know him and to enjoy him. The word that Jesus uses here when he says, I never knew you, is the Greek word ginosko. Let's say that together, ginosko. Ginosko means to recognize, to know intimately as a husband knows his wife. As a matter of fact, sometimes that same word ginosko is used to uh, indicate like 
the intimate relationship between a husband and wife. And that's, that's obviously not what, he's, what Jesus is talking about here. But it, it, he's saying that, that he wants a relationship that's so close, it's like a husband and wife. It's gnosko. When he says, get away from me, I never knew you. What he's saying is, I never knew you personally. I never knew you intimately. Now, there's another word that he uses in Matthew 7. And it's the word uh, oida. Let's say that together, oida. Okay, now oida is in Matthew 7, 11. If you go to verse 11 there. Verse 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask him? So when he says here, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts. So that word oida means to possess information, to understand, to be able to use knowledge. Now, there's a difference, obviously, between understanding someone and knowing someone or understanding how to use knowledge and knowing them personally. And we need both in the Christian life. And I think, really, this is the main problem with the church today is we teach people oida and not ginosko. We teach people, I mean, if the church is faithful in proclaiming the truth... Okay, that they'll teach people, okay, here are true things about Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus rose from the dead. If you repent and believe, you will have eternal life. You will have your sins forgiven. Like, these are facts that we teach young children. Hopefully, if they come into Awana, they learn these facts. And they might be able, if they're in the church long enough, to rattle off different things and to say, well, do you believe Jesus is God? Well, yes. Well, do you believe he died on the cross? Yes. Do you believe he rose from the dead? Sure, yeah, okay. Well, the devil also believes those things. Listen now. The devil also believes those things. And if we teach our people that being a Christian means I have the right set of yeses and nos. I have the right creedal affirmation. I can recite the Apostles' Creed. I can say the like right things about God, and I know the difference between right and wrong things about God. And I, I know that. And thus, of course, I'm a Christian. And we are doing a disservice to the body of Christ. And what I'm trying to tell you right now is you can know everything there is to know in the Word of God. You can have it memorized and still not be saved. You know how I know that? Because the Pharisees had the Bible memorized and they weren't saved. Because the Pharisees could tell you every kind of theological ivory tower kind of you know, concept, and really they loved the theology, and they read the theological books, and they had a big library, and they even said, Charles Spurgeon is my favorite, and they, you know, like that. It doesn't matter. If you only possess information about God, but you don't know him personally, it's not saving faith. You need to have both. John Stott says, the people Jesus is describing here are relying for salvation on a creedal affirmation on what they say to or about Christ. But our final destiny will be settled neither by what we're saying today nor by what we shall say to him on the last day, but by whether our verbal confession is accompanied by moral obedience. Whether our verbal confession is accompanied by actual relationship. I don't like it when people say, well, if the Lord says to you on the last day, why should I let you in here? Listen to me now. If the Lord says to you on the last day, why should I let you in here? You do not know him. That's the truth, okay? Because think about this. If your friend comes to your door, someone who you love, who you have a relationship with, and you open the door and you're, you're like this, will you say to your best friend who loves you and you love him and you have a really close friendship with him, all right, a brother maybe, and would you say, hey, why should I let you into my house? You would never say that to your friend. 
As soon as your friend came to the door, you would say, Ah, my friend, I love you. Welcome. That's what you would say. The only person you would ever say that to is somebody you didn't know. Somebody says, hey, I want to come into your house. Right? Like, think about just, I mean, actually, think about this for a second. Someone knocks on your door, and you open the door, and you don't know. They're a stranger. You weren't expecting them. And they knock on your door, and they say, hey, I want to come into your house right now. <laughs> they might be meeting with Mr. Smith and Wesson. <laughs> you would never say that. I don't like it when Christians say, well, well Jesus is going to say, oh, why should I let? No, he's not. He's not, not if you know him. He'll welcome you right away. You don't have to worry about that. I was always so worried about, like, when I first became a, a believer and people would say that, you know, like, what? I'm always worried about, like, oh, I think when I see Jesus face to face, I'm going to be like this. Oh. <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. I, I was worried. Like, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know if I'll be able to say anything. It's Jesus, after all. I'll probably be dumbstruck. He knows you. He'll welcome you. He'll bring you in. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now, I have to say this. It's right to call Jesus Lord. As a matter of fact, if you don't call Jesus Lord, then on the opposite side, you're also not a believer, all right? Because you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. If you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth. So the fact that these people are saying, Lord, Lord, that's not bad. It's that they had the first part and not the second part. They confessed with their mouth, but they didn't know him in their heart. They didn't have a relationship with him. And if Jesus is truly your Lord, then you'll know him and you'll obey him. Otherwise, maybe he really isn't your Lord and you're serving an idol instead. Why do you think James says, but don't, listen, uh, but don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are just fooling yourselves. If you're not a true disciple, you might fool other people. You might even fool yourself, but you'll never fool Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, 27, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus' sheep follow him. Listen now. Jesus' sheep follow him. If you know him in this way, ginosko, you intimately know him, then you will follow him. And if you do not follow him, it is the sure evidence that you do not know him in this way. You only know about him. That's it. So I'm going to read a passage right now that has... Uh, really tripped up a lot of people. As a matter of fact, when um, Martin Luther first read this passage, he said, he said, I mean, I think he repented of it later. At least I hope he did. He said, oh, I wish that wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> okay. Oh, snap. That's kind of a scary thing to say. All right. James chapter 2, starting at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You want to, do you want to be shown, uh, you foolish person, that faith apart, works, apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Wow. And in the same way... Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Whoa. 
so do we throw out 500 years of Protestantism now, which says, how are we justified? By grace, through faith, alone. And yet, here James says, well, faith without works is dead. So how do we reconcile these two things? How do we reconcile James chapter 2 with Ephesians chapter 2? By grace you have been saved. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, by grace you have been saved through faith and not of works. Okay. It is the gift of God. So then, if Paul says that we've been saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast, it's the gift of God. And James says, faith without works is dead. Are these two contradicting each other? They're not contradicting each other. They're not, because God is not a God of confusion, and God is not a God of contradiction. We are justified by faith alone, but not by faith that stays alone. You understand? I'm going to say that again. We're justified by faith alone, but not by faith that stays alone. In other words, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done all the work for us on the cross already. We're not justified by our works whatsoever. But once we are justified, works will follow from that. And if those works which follow from our justification are not there, it is proof that our faith is not real. Our relationship with Jesus was never real. That's what it means. That's what James is talking about. In other words, and to, to take it away from just, you know, like faith works, I don't really understand this. Here's what it means. It means this. If you say you believe in Jesus Christ, if, you're, if that relationship that you have with him is real, then you will obey him. You will repent of your sins. You will follow him and trust him and walk with him. And if you never repent of your sins and follow him and trust him and walk with him, that is the clearest evidence that you never really knew him. That's it. Faith without works is dead. Those works which follow the faith must be there as the evidence of the faith. Now, this is a hard passage. But scripture interprets scripture. And I just want to look, in the time that we have left, I want to look at a, a passage from the Old Testament that really illustrates this. It's from 1 Samuel 15. We're going to take a look at 1 Samuel 15 and then we'll be finished. We've looked at this passage before. It's about a man named Saul. says this, and Samuel said to Saul, now Saul is the king of Israel, Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, now therefore listen to the words of the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have, do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Taliam, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Al Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Now, is that what the Lord told him to do? He took him alive now. And devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people, look at verse 9. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Is that what the Lord told him to do? Let's just keep your finger here. Let's just remember here, up here, what it says. Verse 3, go and strike Amalek, devote to destruction all that they have. Okay, verse 9. 
he would not utterly destroy them. All, was, all that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. Verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to, to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told to Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, they set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, listen, Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Look it, really? Saul, really? I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Do you know in that moment, I really believe that Saul believed what he was saying. He believed it. He came happy. He, he went to the prophet and he's like, I did it. I did everything. I did everything the Lord told me to do. Verse 14. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we've devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Oh, well, speak. See, again, still, you, Saul is like, he doesn't understand what's going on, all right? He's like, Oh, the Lord has a word for me? Oh, I want to hear what it is. Yeah, tell me. Okay. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on a mission on which the Lord sent me. I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've devoted to the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, the sheep in the auction, the best of the things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. See, this guy doesn't get it. He keeps saying over and over and over, I've done what the Lord said. Oh, yeah, sure, there's all these different exceptions and all that, but, but, but I've really done it. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Jesus says in our passage today, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says that they will give this kind of uh, uh, testimony, this retort to the Lord. They'll say, but Lord, didn't we do this and do that and do that? And his response is, I never knew you. You didn't obey me. You didn't serve me. You served yourself. I see a few very important things here in this passage in 1 Samuel that apply to our passage. First, it's possible to be self-deluded. It's possible to be self-deluded. There are hucksters who treat others into thinking that they're upstanding Christians, but there are also those who trick themselves into thinking that they're Christians. Okay? There's a difference between those two. Sometimes, sometimes they're the same. But, but there really are people out there. I mean, we saw in those videos last week, there really are people out there who, like, they, you know, like, they can't actually believe that they're actually followers of Christ. They just love m money and fame more than anything else. All right? But there are some people who really deceive themselves. And they think about themselves that they are. And that's why James said, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. All, otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Saul, Saul thought that he was doing well, but he wasn't obeying God, so he deluded himself. Second, it's possible to do things for God or in God's name, but your heart is actually elsewhere. 
Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, Here's something really, really important for us to learn. Okay. These people here were doing things in the name of Jesus, doing works. And what does Jesus say about them? That the works that they were doing were actually works of lawlessness. Lawlessness, in other words, evil. Okay? Listen now. Verse 22 in Matthew 7. On that day, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Okay, so prophesying in your name or, or, or even, you know, giving a sermon in Jesus' name. That's what it's talking about here. Did we not cast out demons in your name? So they came, somebody who's a demon-possessed person, to say, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. And the, the demon came out. Do many mighty works in your name. We went all over the place, country to country. Lots of people were being saved. We were preaching the truth about you. We did all those things, Lord. All of those things for you. And what does he say? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. How could he call doing works in his name works of lawlessness? Sin. That all those things those people that he's talking about were doing were actually sin that they were doing. They were not actually doing them for God. That's why. Hebrews says, without faith, Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. So it doesn't really matter if somebody does something in Jesus' name. Or they come to a Bible study and they do the study in Jesus' name. Or they say, you know, they say with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, but their heart is far from Him. Don't you see? I keep pounding it. You know, one of the things that I'm sometimes critiqued about when I preach is that I pound the same thing over and over. Do you know why? Because we forget so easily. Because I forget so easily the, the, these, this foundational, fundamental truth that, you know, I, I can even deceive myself if I allow this to happen, where I sometimes think like, well, hey, I'm reading this Bible now, and I've read more chapters than I was even allotted to read in my Robert Murray Machine Bible reading plan today. Ah, the Lord must be pretty happy with me. It doesn't work like that. Do you know that Jesus Christ will not love you any more or less in the future than he loves you right now? No matter what you do or do not do, if you have a relationship with him, if you know him, he's not going to love you anymore based on, you know, I've done this thing or that thing. These people were doing all of these works, but they weren't doing it from the heart out of love for God. They were doing it for other reasons. They were doing it for fame, or they were doing it for money, or they were doing it for, you know, so they could have recognition from their peers. That's why they were doing it. And so anything that we don't do in faith, even if we do it in Jesus' name, even if we do it as a part of the church, even if we volunteer for a ministry, even if we do anything like that, if we're not doing it because I love you, Jesus, that's why I'm doing it, out of love for you and out of love for you alone. If it's not for that reason, it's a work of lawlessness. Sin. Sin is all it is. If you Listen now, if you come here and you sit in the pew and you listen to a sermon and you're not here because you love Jesus, what you're doing when you come here and sit in the pew is sin. You're just sinning. You're just sinning. How are you sinning? Well, maybe because oh, I came here because, like, my spouse dragged me here. I'm not here for Jesus. I'm here to please my spouse. If you're here to please your spouse, you're sinning. 
That's not the reason to come to church. That's not, not why Jesus made his church. This church is his church. This isn't my church. This isn't the elder's church. This is his church. It's his. He tells us why we come. Read the book of Acts. We see the apostles came together to worship the Lord, to fellowship with each other out of love for Jesus. That's why. That's why. Now, I'm not telling somebody who's here, whose spouse dragged them here, I want you to leave. I don't want you to leave. You should come here. You should listen to the truth. Repent of your sin. Trust in Christ. Know him personally. He is available for that. But anything that we do that's not out of a heart of, and relationship of, and love of Jesus is sin. Anything. That's hard to swallow. Okay? That's a truth that's really hard to swallow. Because some, you know, we were talking about this in book club recently, where, you know, <laughs> I, I think I might have mentioned this before, where like, you know, when people talk about good works, like the first thing they always bring up is helping an old lady across the street, okay? And, and I, I, I've said to you before, like, I have hardly ever seen an old lady who needed help crossing the street, ever. Why that is like the paramount of a good work, I have no idea. And, and where people got this idea of, like, helping old ladies across the street is probably the best thing a person can ever do. I help all these old ladies across the street all the time. <laughs> For real, though. I mean, am I, am, am I crazy? Am I the only one who always hears that? If you help an old lady across the street. Like, okay, all right, all right. If you do that and you're doing it for any other reason than out of obedience to Christ and loving my neighbor, for instance. I love my neighbor. I see she needs help. Because I love her, because I love Christ, I love her. So I want to help her. That's a true motive. That's a true reason why to do it. But, but if you're doing it for any other reason, like, you know what? I'm going to help her across the street. Hey, let's go. And you're walking across the street and you walk away and you say, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty, pretty good. Look what I did. I helped another old lady across the street. Then that good work that you did was actually sin. You weren't doing it for God. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it to feel good. And you posted it on Facebook and you said, helped another old lady across the street today. You're doing it so that you could have that currency, which is the, the most popular currency in the whole world today. It's called a Facebook like. The currency of likes. I don't like likes. What, what's the purpose of a like on the Facebook? So you could feel this little, like, Poof of, of chemical that it's the same thing, the same chemical that, that people have when they do crack cocaine or other heroin or whatever. It's the same chemical that is like, bing, like goes off just a little bit when you're addicted to likes. I'm, I'm for real on that. Some people live for it. And they refresh, refresh, refresh the page because they really want likes from people. They really want to feel like everyone thinks they're funny. Or they really want to feel like, like, hey, affirm me. I need to be affirmed by all of you. Tell me good things. I need good things from you. Tell them to me. Please fill me up. Instead of being affirmed by God. I would much rather have the affirmation of God than the affirmation of anyone else. Do you agree? I really hope that God never says to any of us, get away from me, I never knew you, you evildoers. Saul did many things seemingly for God. 1 Samuel 15, 11 says that Saul turned away from God. He turned away. Thirdly, it's possible to know about the God of the Bible and yet still not know the God of the Bible. Saul didn't love God as much as he loved glory. 
And that's why he was jealous of David. And we see later on, David is anointed as the king. And what does Saul keep trying to do? I mean, he hears a song. And I don't know what the melody was of these songs from, you know, back in the day. He hears a song, and the song is, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. All right? And like, they're like playing this song, and Saul's like, I've only killed thousands, and David's killed tens of thousands? Mm. And he takes his spear, and he tries to pin David to the wall with it. Why? Because he wasn't doing his military exploits for the Lord. He was doing them so that the people could sing a song about him. That's why. So that he'd be remembered, so that he'd be famous. Passion is not a sign of true relationship. Having a liver shiver is not a sign of a true relationship with Jesus. If you say, well, but, but when I come here and I, and I sing, in Christ alone my hope is found, I feel like, <sighs> like some kind of a shiver inside. That's not proof of a true relationship with Jesus, just because you feel that. Being able to speak about God and read theology is not proof of a true relationship with Jesus. The scariest person, if you ever read this book, best book outside the Bible I've ever read, it's called Pilgrim's Progress. If you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, the scariest person to me in Pilgrim's Progress is a man named Talkative. And Talkative is the scariest person to me because what do I do every Sunday? I get up and I tell, I speak. I talk about Jesus. And there's such a danger in, you know, oh, getting up here into this pulpit. The, the responsibility of speaking the truth about this to God's people is, really makes me tremble. All right, But there's, there's a, a, a chance that a person could get up and, and know lots of things about theology and even learn, know how to speak really, really well and and. And people say, oh, he's a really good speaker and all of that. And it's all talk and not real. Not real in here. That's talkative. He could talk all about God. About good things and bad things and happy things and sad things. And it had no effect upon his life. No obedience in his life to God because he didn't know him. So having passion isn't a sign of true relationship. Liver shivers aren't a sign of having a true relationship. Being able to speak about God is not a sign of a true relationship. Having an experience. Ah, but I had this experience where I felt this amazing thing and suddenly my heart was filled with love. And then the next week it was like, I went back to smoking weed and getting drunk and having an immoral relationship with my girlfriend. and You know, but I had that experience though. That's not a sign of true relationship with Jesus. Having confidence is not a sign of a true relationship with Jesus. You might have confidence. These people had confidence when they approached the Lord. And they said, Lord, Lord, but we did all these things. They were confident. When they, when they died, they died peacefully because they thought, well, I've done all these things. And yet the Lord says, I never knew you. Okay, so if those things aren't signs, I mean, are you being convicted at all by this? If those things aren't signs of a true relationship, then what are? We need to know that. We need to know that. First, three things. One, to truly know Christ is to worship Him in spirit and in truth. In the words of Keith Green, a true Christian is someone who's bananas for Jesus. They love Jesus. They love Jesus for who he is. They love God for who he is and not just for what he can do for them. They don't look at God as a cosmic genie. They don't look at God as someone who can fulfill all of their dreams. And Lord, if you would just fulfill my dreams, then I'll actually follow you and obey you. No, a true believer, one who has a relationship with the Lord, sees God for who he really is and loves him because of it. Loves him for what he's already done on the cross. 
not for what he's going to do for me tomorrow or the next day. I'm thankful for those things. I know that God blesses me better than I ever deserve. But do you love him because of who he is? Do you worship him in truth? Second, to truly know Christ is to obey him. To obey him. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5 say, says this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. See that word but is really important here. At one time, we were led astray, slaves to passions and pleasures. We hated people. We were hated by people. But then, something happened and changed. Something changed inside of me. I can remember a time when I was disobedient to God, and then I wanted to obey God. In my heart, I wanted to obey Him. His words to me were no longer burdensome. Reading the Bible was not something that I felt like was a chore anymore. I wanted to know the Bible. I wanted to know who he is. I wanted to serve him. I wanted him to be pleased. I wanted to live for God's good pleasure. Do you know him like that? Third, to truly know God is to obey him. I'm sorry, that's second. To truly know God is to obey him. Third, to truly know God is to love him. To love him. That's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love him for who he is. In this book, I'll close with this. It's called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's a classic book. Really, really excellent. You can find it on Amazon pretty cheap. I, I really recommend this book um, to all of you. He says, what is a Christian? He is a man who acknowledges and lives under the word of God. He submits without reserve to the word of God written in the scripture of truth. Believing the teaching, trusting the promises, following the commands. His eyes are to the God of the Bible as his father and the Christ of the Bible as his savior. He will tell you if you ask him that the word of God has both convinced him of sin and assured him of forgiveness. His conscience, like Luther's, is captive to the word of God. And he aspires, like the psalmist, to have his whole life brought into line with it. He wants his whole life, the true Christian, wants his whole life to be brought into line with this word. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes. The promises are before him as he prays, and the precepts are before him as he moves among men. He knows that in addition to the word of God spoken directly to him in the scriptures, God's word has also, also gone forth to create and control and order things all around him. But since the scriptures tell him that all things work together for his good, the thought of God ordering his circumstances brings him only joy. You understand what that means? That, that when we think about the fact that God has ordered my steps, it brings me joy no matter what my circumstances are. Independent of my circumstances, I have joy because I know that the God who loved me, the God who died for me, and who was raised from the dead, he orders my steps. And he loves me, and he has a purpose for me. And because I know that, I can have joy no matter what. He is an independent fellow. He says the Christian is independent, for he uses the word of God as a touchstone by which to test the various views that are put to him. And he will not touch anything uh, which he is not sure that Scripture sanctions. You understand? That... that we're independent. What he, what he means is this, that it doesn't matter what the world says. The world might say, you should do this. And the Christian says, I want to follow what God says, not what the world says. I want to obey him. I'm independent from the world. I'm in the world, but I'm no longer of the world. I once was of the world. I was a slave of the world. I had to do whatever the world said, but not anymore. 
Now that I know Christ, the world is dead to me, crucified to me, and now I'm crucified to it. Why does this description fit so few of us who profess to be Christians in these days? You'll find it profitable to ask your conscience and let your conscience tell you the answer. Do you know Christ like that? If you don't know Christ like that, then maybe the Holy Spirit is compelling you in this moment to ask the Lord Jesus, help me to know you. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. I want to know all of that, Lord. I want to know you personally to have a real living and abiding relationship with you. Let's pray. Father, give that to us. Give that to us, Lord. May we know you, not just about you, but know you. And may you know us. And Lord, I pray now that no one within the sound of my voice would hear those words, get away from me, I never knew you. That no one hearing this sermon today in this church would allow themselves to even go one more day without asking God to have a relationship with them. Oh, Father, have mercy on your servant. Have mercy on your servants at the Village Church of Barrington, the Callis family, and the loss of their son. Lord, I pray that you give them your peace. Peace that can really only come from a relationship with you. Thank you for every single person in this church, Lord. I love them very much. I know you love them. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the blood of Christ has power to cleanse us of all of our sins to reconcile us to himself no matter what we've ever done in the past no matter uh, what kind of a, a life we lived or a person we were when we have a relationship with Christ we become a new creation and the, the power is in the blood of Christ to do that let's stand together and sing hymn number 329